Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. This episode is part one of a two-part series. This episode discusses the details of a double murder and may not be suitable for all ages. Listener's discretion is advised. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Today we have Wayne Johnson, who is a librarian at Central Library. He will be talking about Marion Miley. She was Lexington's golfing great during a time when female golfers were virtually unheard of. She accomplished so much during her life, but it all ended so tragically. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you, Marion. Let's start with Marion's early life. Marion yeah. Ego Miley, that was her middle name, Ego. Her mother's maiden name was Ego. Mm-hmm. And Miley had the talent to have an ego, but she was a pretty <laughs> humble person. But that was her middle name, Ego. She was born on March 14, 1914, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to Fred and Elsie Miley. She was raised in Fort Pierce, Florida, which was a small town on the Atlantic coast, a few miles north of Palm Beach. Her father was a golf club professional. He had gone to Fort Pierce when Marion was about five or six years old, and that's where she was raised. He had a job down there in a club, Mm -hmm. and that's that's where she was raised. Her father relocated to the Lexington Country Club here in Lexington in 1929, and Marion and her mother stayed in Florida for Marion to finish high school. Mm -hmm. And when she finished high school, in, I believe, 1930, she she and her mother joined her father in Lexington. Okay. Uh, now, in her early years, you know, Marion didn't start golfing until she was about 12 years old. Yeah. Uh, her father introduced her to the game, and that's when she started playing. But in her early years, she was very interested in music, uh, liked the piano, liked the violin, and had thoughts of having a music career wow. you know, when she grew up. Yeah, and she, track, yeah. yeah. And she even uh, thought about maybe studying medicine in college and becoming a, a doctor. But once she was introduced to the game of golf, mm-hmm. uh, her attention was diverted to that pursuit. Yeah. yeah. But um, So her father was in and around golfing from early on, so she had an early taste of, of the game. But yeah. she didn't start playing until, you said, until she was 12? 12. 12. Were She's, they yeah? Were they supportive of her? Were they supportive oh, of her game and, oh, and getting into it? Oh, oh, yeah. Uh, her good. father, like I said, was a club professional, mm-hmm. so I'm sure he was more than happy that his daughter, his only child, yeah. Take up the game because yeah. that was his love. Mm-hmm. Now, her, her father was from Philadelphia, from mm-hmm. a big family, an old family in, in Philadelphia. I think mm-hmm. there's like 11 kids. Yeah. And her mom was from Baden, Germany. Mm-hmm. Her mom, Elsie, they immigrated to the United States when, when she was young. Mm-hmm. And they settled in Buffalo. And then they went to Philadelphia, where I'm assuming that's where she met uh Marion's father, Fred, uh, and then uh, I assume they were married and Mm -hmm. had Marion. Fred was a golf professional, and as a player, he he didn't have much of a career. He did play in the the 1915 U.S. Open, which is like the biggest tournament, but he didn't make the the cut. Mm -hmm. He was a good player. He just wasn't quite good enough to to play play with (laughs) the best. He made a living Um, going from club to club. mm -hmm playing in these high-stakes golf matches. Mm -hmm. Against the professionals? Well, against people who, other golfers who Mm -hmm. were looking to maybe make some money. And he would go around to these different uh, golf clubs and golf courses Mm -hmm. and actually made a pretty good income that way. Um, he, He was also an expert golf club maker and a teacher. He, mm-hmm. he knew how to teach the game. That's why he was a club professional. And he even uh, dabbled with uh, uh, golf course design. Okay. So golf was his skill set, and he loved it, used it to make money mm-hmm. and, and support his family. Mm-hmm. 
and, and his supportive uh, of his daughter's yes, love for the game. Yes. He introduced her, like I said, at the age of 12 to golfing in, mm -hmm. in uh, 1926. And Marion took a casual interest mm -hmm. at in first. golfing at first. And then I guess the more and more she played and the, and the better that she got at it, the more interested she became mm -hmm. in it. It uh, grabbed her competitive spirit probably. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, like I said, she came to Lexington in 1930, and after she finished high school uh, and, and came to Lexington, she would spend the summers, mm her -hmm. uh, first couple summers in Lexington at the Lexington Country Club, mm -hmm. honing her golf skills. Mm -hmm. And then she, when fall came, she attended Florida State Women's College in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to remember, this was before Title IX. Yeah. So, as far as college sports and that type mm -hmm. thing, women just... They, they just played. They didn't they, play. Uh, yeah, yeah. There wasn't any kind of organization supportive. Or, yeah. Yes. And another thing about Marion and golf is that at that time, women in sports was basically limited to cheerleading mm -hmm. or tennis or swimming. This is why I was also fascinated about her parents being so supportive. Is that this during this time period, it's virtually unheard of for women to be involved in sports. Yeah. Yes. Or at least major. And, but she, she had a knack for golf and spent her summers at the Lexington Country Club playing it. And then after a couple years, when you, she started having some success in golf, she dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. But out I of think college. Uh, out, yeah, out of college after her sophomore year at Florida State mm -hmm. and uh, started concentrating just on golf. She had won the Kentucky Women's State Open in 1931. And in fact, she ended up from 1931 through 1938, she won the tournament six times out of eight years wow. and she was by far the best golfer in the state of kentucky and you have to remember at this time women's amateur golf was really big mm -hmm. because there was no professional ranks mm -hmm. during the depression era for for some reason women's golf amateur golf really became popular oh, okay and she fit right in with that she's a very talented golfer mm -hmm. very personable very competitive mm -hmm. And like I said, this is before Title IX, so mm -hmm. amateur sports was, was the thing for her. Well, during the Depression, did people um, have the money to kind of be able to play well, sports? And now, most of her competition, if not all her competition mm -hmm. during the Depression era, was women who were members of clubs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they played golf. Yeah. Not everybody played golf or had the opportunity to play golf back then. Basically, her competition were uh, women and young girls whose parents belonged to golf clubs. Wealthy, okay. the, you know, yeah, yeah, the wealthy. Mm -hmm. Wealthy families. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, the competition was really tough. Now, Marion was different than, than a lot of these uh, golfers because even though she mingled with the golf club country club set. Her father was a club professional mm -hmm. and she didn't grow up wealthy. Yeah. So he worked at the country club. Yes, yeah, he worked. He worked. Yeah. But she had access mm -hmm. to the clubs and socialized with, with all the club members and fit in quite well. Yeah. Uh, now she played her first important tournament uh, at the age of 17. Uh, as I mentioned, she won the Kentucky State Women's Amateur in Louisville. She would repeat again many times. Um, and during the decade of the 30s, mm -hmm. she won numerous other tournaments throughout the United States. And uh, she also won the Mexican Open one year. Oh. And I think it was the Mexican Open that she met the famous entertainer, Bing Crosby. Mm -hmm. And Bing Crosby was so taken by her, he, he wanted to uh, meet up with her and play a golf match. Mm -hmm. uh, Bing Crosby loved golf. Yeah. You know, he sponsored his own golf tournament later on in life. And he really respected good golfers. Mm -hmm. And he was taken by Marion Miley, and they, they were pretty good friends. That's, and, uh, that's interesting. You know, the one... Tournament. She she had a, all kinds of success during the 30s and early 40s, playing amateur golf throughout the country. Mm -hmm. They had a what they called I think the Orange Blossom Tour down in Florida mm -hmm. uh, every winter, where all the best women golfers of the United States would go down to Florida and play in a tour down there, mm -hmm. uh, and they would travel from city to city and play different clubs and tournaments. 
and uh, she had a lot of success down there uh, during the 30s. Uh, Seems like she traveled quite a bit for these tournaments. And, oh yes, and, yeah. throughout she she traveled throughout the world mm -hmm. playing golf. It was yeah. it was mostly in the states, but there were times where she would go to like Mexico or mm -hmm. London and play mm -hmm. in a golf tournament. Women's golf back then it was match play. Mm -hmm. It wasn't where like you get fifty players and yeah. they play four days and whoever has the best mm -hmm. uh, score at the end of the four days wins the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, match play was how they did women's amateur golf. And that is, they'd have a tournament and you'd be matched against one golfer. Mm -hmm. And then once you beat that golfer, you mm -hmm. move on to the next okay. round and next round. And uh, I've always wondered how much more she would have won. I mean, she had quite a bit of su success mm -hmm. as a match player, but uh, I've always thought your best golfers, the ones that win, they do it over a four day period. Yeah. And in match play, you you can have one bad day or even one bad shot and you lose that match. So You're I think out. Yeah. yeah, I think it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, not that I'm a expert golfer, <laughs> but I think it'd be more difficult to win those one on one matches and yeah. get to the finals. Yeah. Uh, but she she had quite a bit of success, won plenty of matches. The only match or the only tournament that eluded her during her mm -hmm. career was the uh, U.S. Open mm -hmm. Championship for for the amateurs. Mm -hmm. She made the semifinals twice, which is quite an achievement in itself. Yeah. I think she was going to win it eventually. Mm -hmm. Just that Her things. Life ended, yes. How did she pay for the travel? If you, I mean, you said that she doesn't come from a wealthy background. How was she able to afford um, traveling, and um, and the, so what other yeah, ways? Well, they would they would have their sponsors and mm -hmm. their expenses paid. I see. And she would have, uh, for an example, Standard Oil. She had a contract with Standard Oil, mm -hmm. where she would uh, the job was inspecting gasoline stations. Interesting. Wow, and, yeah, that's different. Than and <laughs> and of course, Standard Oil mm -hmm. was uh, more than happy to have. Mary and Molly yeah. as the face of their company because she's very photogenic and very personable. But mm -hmm. what she would do is she would, like she went down to Florida to do the tournaments, mm -hmm. she would travel from city to city and the, and the station she had scheduled to inspect mm -hmm. coincidentally matched the location <laughs> of where the tournaments were. So, you know, she, well, she, she, she was very... And I think she may have got this from her father because mm -hmm. he seems he seemed like a really good business guy. Mm -hmm. She had, in my view, just researching her, had a great sense of business and yeah. how to make money. Yeah, and in, it in the right, like it. In the right, she, in the she, right way. Yeah, she made things work for her advantage. Yes. So she was also a member of the uh, Curtis Cup team, which is the equivalent of the Ryder Cup team uh, now that the U.S. men play, and she was. Chosen for the team in 1934, 1936, and 1938. You know, the press and the fans just of golf just loved her. Yeah, yeah. It seems like she was interviewed quite a bit. She was so respected and revered that on May 25th, 1939, Lexington had what they called a Marion Miley Day. Yeah. If I can read this short proclamation. Sure. This is the uh, full text of uh, Mayor uh, Wilson's mm -hmm. uh, proclamation on Marion Miley Day here in Lexington in 1939. Uh, whereas in the world of sports today, as well as in the business and professional field of accomplishments, women are playing an ever increasingly prominent and active part. And the proclamation continues, whereas outstanding among these women is our own champion woman golfer, Miss mm -hmm. Marion Miley, who has won national prominence and fame during the past few years and who only last week for the second successive year was winner of the Southern Women's Golf Championship Tournament at Ponte Vedra, Florida. Whereas the citizens of Lexington, the civic clubs, and city officials are justly proud of the recognition and prestige which Miss Molly has earned by her brilliant golf and wholesome personality, all of which reflects great honor on her hometown. Now, therefore, I, Reed Wilson, Mayor, hereby proclaim Thursday, May 25th, as Marion Miley Day in Lexington, and heartily endorse the program of the Optimist Club, 
urging that those who desire to pay tribute to this gallant young lady should attend the entertainment to be given in her honor on that day. Oh, so it, it's quite an accomplishment when you have a day uh, yeah, named for, after you. And it's in, it, in Lexington, wasn't even her hometown, but yeah. uh, she was adopted. Uh, she was quite, adopted by the Lexingtonians. Yeah, she, yeah. She's, a, she's an official Lexingtonian mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Which, which makes all of her murder all the more tragic. Yeah. yeah. As mentioned earlier, Marion Miley's life ended very abruptly um, and tragically. What happened? Oh, well, that's probably one of Lexington's most tragic mm -hmm. uh, days, mm -hmm. the most brutal crime probably in our history, uh, given the circumstances. Yeah. On Saturday evening, September 27, 1941, just a short couple months before Pearl Harbor, yeah. uh, the Lexington Country Club, which Marion, she actually, Marion and her mom lived at the Lexington Country Club up oh, okay. in an upstairs uh, apartment. Mm -hmm. And they held weekly Saturday night dances. And uh, now early that Saturday evening, uh, Marion was actually playing cards at a friend's house over on McDowell Road mm -hmm. and uh, didn't attend the dance. But she returned to the Lexington Country Club around midnight um, and then went, went to uh, bed. Mm -hmm. The dance uh, did not get over with until like 1 or one thirty. That early Sunday morning, mm -hmm. uh, September 28th, and after the dance was over, the mother, uh, Elsie, was the uh, uh, manager of the club. Oh, so it was her job to like collect the receipts, put mm -hmm. them in the safe, and and do all the bookkeeping. Mm -hmm. She she ran the club, so she was a very astute business person herself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then she went to bed. Well, about. Uh, Somewhere maybe two thirty, three o'clock in the morning, two mm -hmm. men broke into the country club. Okay. One of them had heard that they kept large amounts of money mm -hmm. in the club after dances. Yeah. And so these guys knew that the country club kept a large amount of money on the grounds after a dance, yeah. maybe four or five thousand dollars. They broke into the country club mm -hmm. and their information was that the money was kept downstairs, like in a desk or a, okay. a safe or something. Mm -hmm. That was not locked. Yeah. So they went downstairs and looked all over and couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. There was a stairwell mm -hmm. and a door that was locked leading up to the second floor uh, apartments where Marion and her mom were sleeping. So where was the father? Where was uh, Fred? Now, at this point, Fred Miley, he went where the work was. Yeah. So he had left the Lexington Country Club uh, maybe a couple, few years before that, mm -hmm. and found a higher paying job as a club professional in Cincinnati. I see. So he wasn't there. They were still family, but yeah. he, he... He just uh, worked and then he traveled worked. back. And in fact, Marion was going to actually go up there the next day, Sunday, to play in some golf matches. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was anxiously awaiting her to appear. But uh, that's where he was during the murders. Okay. But anyway... When they didn't find, when the two crooks didn't find any money on the first floor or the amount of money they mm -hmm. wanted, they broke into a locked door on the second floor where the apartment was. And Elsie encountered them because she heard the noise of, of them breaking in. And she confronted them and they demanded, you know, where's the money? And, you know, she tried to stall them or whatever, but they beat her and shot her and then. Uh, Marion heard the ruckus, came out of her bedroom mm -hmm. uh, apartment, and apparently punched one of the uh, assailants. Yeah, mm -hmm. which uh, she she was going to go down fighting. Mm -hmm. And the other uh, crook, they had guns with them, mm -hmm. shot her in the back, and then shot her point blank in the head. Yeah, and uh, and they shot the mom mm -hmm. uh, three times in the stomach. And they ended up getting like $140. Then they, of course, they left So the money it. that they came looking for wasn't there? No. Okay. Uh, apparently there uh, there was receipts where people would charge things mm -hmm. and then they would pay or uh, for, yeah. for whatever reason, the money that they thought was going to be there wasn't there. Yeah. Or else I think, you know, Mrs. Miley would have just gone in to prevent any yeah. kind of violence would have uh, given it to them mm -hmm. to get them out of the country club mm -hmm. but uh, they they killed uh, Marion on the spot she died right there mm -hmm. 
and the mother was wounded, and the, and the uh, murderers took off. Um, and when I first started hearing about this case years and years ago, well, I, I grew up in Lexington, so I heard about it ever since I was a kid. Yeah. But I didn't realize the superhuman effort the mother uh, achieved that early morning with three bullet holes in her stomach mm-hmm. and bleeding, yeah. basically bleeding to death. She was able to get out of the country club and uh, go across the street about 250 yards and knock on the door. There's something called the Ben Mar Sanatorium across mm-hmm. the road on Paris Pike mm-hmm. and alert them that, you know, that, that their shooting fight. just happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And she collapsed there at the door. They called the ambulance. Um, she was still conscious. And in fact, I read one account where I think she knew Marion was dead. Yeah. And, and all this happened with the lights out. So they, they mm-hmm. had cut the wires and turned off the electricity and turned off or yanked out the yellow telephone wires. Mm-hmm. So there could, could be, and this was before the age of cell phones, mm-hmm. um, they couldn't communicate with anybody. Yeah. And it was total darkness. But I think she had a pretty bad feeling that something mm-hmm. really bad had well, happened sure, to her. Yeah, I'm sure she was aware to, of what happened, what yeah. the surroundings, and as a mother. Yeah, to her daughter. Sure. And like I said, I think it's just a superhuman achievement mm-hmm. for her to be able to do that. But I'd read one account where when the ambulance arrived, she said, go take care of my daughter, mm-hmm. even though Marion was dead. But that, that was... That's the type of woman of her, you know, I guess most mothers would most be Most mothers would too. Yeah. And I, but, but I've always thought in this story that uh, Mrs. Miley, mm-hmm. uh, what she did that night was superhuman. Yeah, that's very um, tragic. Did she pass away right away? or? No, she didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, Marion, they, they called the police mm-hmm. and they came out and uh, Marion, they found Marion dead mm-hmm. in in the uh, stair, uh, the stair aisle there, mm-hmm. and uh, the mother survived for three days. Mm-hmm. Uh, another part of this tragedy is they they called Fred Miley up in Cincinnati mm-hmm. early Sunday morning and, and didn't inform him what happened. They just said there's been an accident at the club. Mm-hmm. Can you come down here? And didn't tell him what happened. Well, he, of course, jumps into his vehicle and starts driving down the road Mm -hmm. to Lexington. And that Sunday morning, uh, the Herald Leader, of course, the early editions didn't cover the the crime because the editions came out so early and they didn't have any news on it. But they put out extras Mm -hmm. uh, on the crime. And it's very rare that they put out extras back Mm -hmm. in the day. It'd have to be like World War starting or a president's assassinated or something. Mm -hmm. But... They did it for Marion Miley, and the, and the extra that came out uh, later on Sunday morning was police hunt Miley murderers. Oh. And unfortunately, to make a bad day even worse for Mr. Miley, he's driving down through Georgetown, rushing to the Lexington Country Club, and finds out about what happened because a newsboy was hawking newspapers on the streets in Georgetown oh, and just... was reading this headline, mm-hmm. Police Hunt Miley Murders. Mm-hmm. And that's how he found out that's awful. about the murder. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, he was devastated. And um, the mother survived for three days. She was able to give police just a little bit of information mm-hmm. on who it was. Yeah, it was. Dark. They, yeah, they, it was dark. They wore masks. But she was able to describe what had happened as far as the break-in and the shooting and so forth. And she went in and out of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, Lexington was in an uproar. But Marion was buried on, I think, Wednesday morning, October 1st at St. Peter's. Mm -hmm. And her mother died about six or seven hours later. Mm -hmm. Uh, The father collapsed at the funeral. He was devastated. And, Understandably uh, so. Yeah. It was a big funeral mm-hmm. for, for Mary, and she had a lot of friends, not only in Lexington and in Kentucky, but she had friends all over the United States that she had made throughout her career. Join us next time to continue our conversation.
Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at L E X P U B L I B dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.